Hello. Welcome, everyone. I'm Arden Sherman. I'm the Glenn W. and Cornelia T. Bailey Senior Curator of Contemporary Art here at the Norton Museum. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to the, to the Norton tonight. Thank you all for being here. Just as a friendly reminder, please silence your phones while you're in the auditorium. Tonight, we are celebrating the exhibition Nora Maite Nieves' Clouds in the Expanded Field. Um, on our, it's on view now on the second floor galleries. In addition to Nora Maite Nieves, we have another special guest with us today, Carla Acevedo Yates. Carla is a curator, researcher, and art critic practicing across Latin America and the Caribbean and the United States. And she has organized dozens of groundbreaking exhibitions and publications. Born and raised in San Juan, Puerto Rico, she currently serves as the Marilyn and Larry Fields curator at the MCA Chicago, where she recently curated the 2022 exhibition Forecast Form, Art in the Caribbean Diaspora, 1990 to today, and Entre Horizontes, Art and Activism Between Chicago and Puerto Rico, which is currently on view and features the work of Nora Maite Nieves. Um, Carla and Nora met can trace what we decide we figured out today they can trace their first meeting back to San Juan in 2006 so that's around 20 years they, that they've known each other so I'm confident that tonight's conversation will be an enlightening discussion of their journeys in the art world from the island to their current stateside locales for the last month Nora has been living and working here on Norton's campus as the 2023-2024 Mary Lucille DeRay Artist in Residence. During this time, she and her husband, the artist Jonathan Gardner, have been utilizing the Gendelman Studio Houses for their art making and exploring the lovely people, places, and things that make South, up the South Florida experience. In addition to the residency, we organize a solo exhibition of Nora's work. For this exhibition, entitled Clouds in the Expanded Field. Nora created nine works in her signature mode of brightly colored acrylics, flash, pigments mixed with molding and fiber paste. The style's distinctly her own. Textures, layers, colors are expansive and often cover five sides of her canvas. There's an, an inherent and immediate physicality when viewing Nora's work. Marking Nora's first solo exhibition, a solo museum exhibition here at the museum, the work on display carries the familiarity of her Puerto Rican roots. From the lush tropical, from the lush natural landscapes to vibrant colored structures and simultaneously incorporates inspiration from the frenetic urban environment of Brooklyn where she resides today. Nora acts as a connector between her worlds combining fragments of decorative elements from the Caribbean with those from the urban landscape she encounters daily. In her work, you find elements like the ubiquitous modernist concrete block, also known as the breeze block, and floor tile patterns from, from past homes and residence where she lived. Nor often references nature, rendering snakes, snake plants, the ocean, and more recently, clouds. In addition, these are these are some uh, installation images of the um, exhibition upstairs that you will see after this talk. In addition to the new paintings, Nora took on the challenge of creating a video this past year. In collaboration with Times Square Arts, Nora's dreamy stop motion Genesis tale will be displayed on 100 monumental digital screens at midnight during the month of February 2024 as part of the Midnight Moment program. Part origin story, part fantasy, the video entitled Eyes of the Sea is a mythological tale of identity and belonging told through color, shape, and movement. And I invite you to explore the, this, this work of art, this video, which is displayed in a multi-screen um, multi, uh, presentation on the upstairs landing next to her exhibition. So before we start our conversation, I just want to take a few moments to thank all of those who helped make this exhibition and tonight's program happen. Firstly, I want to thank the lenders of the exhibition. We cannot make cutting edge exhibitions 
like this without the support of collectors, of artists, and of gallerists who lend their work for display. And I want to underscore their contribution to this project and in general, their contribution to all of our exhibition making here at the Norton. Thank you to Norris Gallery and Bahada, made up of Christopher Rivera and Manuela Paz for assisting with the logistical and promotional support of the exhibition. Behind the scenes, it takes a lot to put, of coordination to put all this together. And without the support of my colleagues, I couldn't have done it. So foremost, I want to thank Tierra Nidlovu, who acted as an assistant curator for this exhibition and my teammate throughout the process. My appreciation for, to our installation team, John Welter, Ashley Kerr, and Carlos Fayur. Their careful attention to every detail is apparent when viewing this exhibition. I'd like to thank Rachel Gustafson and Sarah Bass, who are essential to the curatorial makeup of the Norton. Our registrars, Pam Perry and Victoria Pesta, who manage all the shipping logistics. Our design team of Lorraine Bond and Arthur Salazar, who designed the graphic identity of this project. Bobby Marrero, Scott DeLeon, and AV, who beautifully installed Nora's multi-channel video display upstairs. Thank you to my colleagues in development, who continuously gather funds to support the realization of fresh and ambitious projects like these. Charlie Nolan and Scott Simmons in communication who have garnered loads of press on Nora and her exhibition. So you'll be seeing a lot of that coming up. Jody Seifer and Quincy Bruckerhoff in the Learning and Community Engagement and Art After Dark who facilitated tonight's program an exciting experience. Um, and of course, our team on the ground. We can't do it without you. Security and visitor experiences, they daily manage our visitor, ex our audience experience and you know, make sure that you enjoy yourself and you, uh, when you're in the Norton Museum of Art. Finally, I wanna make one quick plug for membership. If you come to the Norton more than three times a year, it makes, it's a better deal to become a member. And there are all kinds of perks that come with it too. So before we, just one more thing, we have a very special treat at the end of this talk. Um, it will be followed by a paranda. So it's a parade of musicians will lead us into the galleries in celebration of the Eve of Three Kings Day, which is a long-standing Puerto Rican tradition. So please, after we're done the talk, I hope you'll follow us into the exhibition space where Carla and Nora and I will be there um, to answer questions and to meet you. Um, and without further ado, please, I welcome Carla Acevedo Yates and Norma Maite Nieves to the stage with me. Thank you. I'm gonna do the best I can with this uh, handheld here. Okay, so you two met in Puerto Rico. I, I think it's kind of interesting for everyone to go back to the origin story a little bit. Um, uh, in the early aughts, can you paint a picture of what the Puerto Rican art scene was at this time? Um, who was out and about? Who were you talking to? Who were you looking at? Who were your influences? Should I start? <laughs> um, can paint it through, you can paint the picture through your artwork. Yeah. Um, so it was, let's say, 2007. Um, I just graduated from the Escuela Artes Plásticas, my, where I did my undergrad um, in 2004. So <clears throat> in that time, I was like fully trying and becoming an artist and developing my practice and my voice. And I had the great opportunity to have the support of a great gallery in Puerto Rico, which is Galeria Botello. And that's my third exhibition with them in that time. Uh, was a solo exhibition called Lollipop. And I was making work that was inspired by food, by candy. And I was interested in painting as an object in the three-dimensionality of painting, and I wanted to bring paint to, sp to the space, and I was interested in how I can seduce the viewer through materials. So these paintings, um, when you were in front of them, 
they were very glossy, shiny. They kind of look like candy or like melting ice cream or chocolate. And they really invited you or move you to kind of like lick them or touch them. And that's what I wanted for me. That was mission accomplished um, in that time. And I think now my work is still invite and provoke some desire and the desire to touch the painting, but in a different way. Um, so that's, that was Puerto Rico in that time. Um, I wanted, yeah. Um, I remember, I mean, there was a lot of kind of energy at the time. I feel like there was a lot of um, energy around doing things for ourselves. That's what I remember about that time in the mm -hmm. sense of artists and curators or aspiring curators like myself. At that time, I was um, an arts writer. I wasn't a curator. Um, and to understand a little bit the context, Puerto Rico has only a couple of museums and yeah. a few galleries. And Botello, the gallery that you mentioned, um, was a very important gallery led by um, Mod Duquela, um, a, a really important figure within the Puerto Rican cultural context that supported so many artists through the years. But really the infrastructure is kind of fragile, you know, it's not a place where you have a bunch of galleries and museums and um, there really was a lack of support, I would say, for artists and curators at the time, especially young artists and curators. Um, and it was a time where really we um, took it upon ourselves to make our own structures. So there were a lot of artists run spaces. It's a time where, I don't know if you're familiar with Beta Local, it's an institution, um, now it's an institution, that um, kind of welcomes artists, that has a residency program and so on. Um, so it was a, a really time of effervescence, of a cultural effervescence, um, where we were just trying to make things happen. You know, I remember um, trying to publish, you know, art reviews on different artists. Um, there were artists making their own shows and and spaces that really acted as um, multifunctional spaces uh, that were bars, meeting spaces, gathering spaces, galleries. I mean, a really, really effervescent. Um, community of artists that, you know, and some of us left, like I left in 2012, I believe, um, and you left in 2008. In 2008, yeah. In 2008. <clears throat> so uh, some of us left and came back. There's a lot of back and forth in Puerto Rico because of the political context and the relationship, that, that colonial relationship with the United States allows us to come back and forth um, a lot, quite a mm -hmm. lot. Um, but I did leave in 2012 and came back in 2014 and then left again in 2016. So, um, and, and, and some, of, some of us from like that time um, live in New York, like Christopher, for example, um, was part of that you know, generation of artists, curators, writers, poets. Some of us left and some of us stayed on the island. Yeah. And it was, it was I mean, Puerto Rico is always a challenging place. <laughs> Um, to go through many things, but uh, I think me and many of my colleagues left looking for new opportunities for jobs, and I, I was one of them, and I felt like, well, maybe the job I can have is teaching at, at a university, so I need a master. So I decided to go for it and, and left to do my master at the Art Institute of Chicago, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, um, in 2008 which now you live there. I do, <laughs> in Chicago. yeah. Um, so, which was not a surprise. Uh, many Puerto Rican artists um, have gone and selected Chicago as a place to, to transition, to move, to study. Um, uh, not only artists, also political movements have moved to Chicago and, and movement, movements have born in Chicago about Puerto Rico and then brought back to the island, um, moving the independence mm -hmm. and revolutionary. The diasporic yeah. community, Puerto Rican community in Chicago, one of the largest in the US. So like for our, I mean, our generation, it was either New York or Chicago. Maybe some people went to LA, but that was more <coughs> the exception, I would say. Yeah. Like some people went to Hunter, um, yeah. a couple took CalArts, but um, mostly SAIC in Chicago. I went to school in New York, um, both undergrad and graduate school, so it was mostly like New York and Chicago. And Chicago was like a place for painters, <laughs> I yes. think, in, in Puerto Rico, um, starting with, I call the pioneer, would be like um, Arnaldo Roche Rabel, um, a famous, recognized 
painter from Puerto Rico, and I think he led the way for for other painters to go. Um, and there's other video artists, Beatriz Santiago. Um, so there's there's a long history with with Chicago, and I felt moved by it, and I felt like trust. This is a place I can go and make something out of it. So. I just want to <clears throat> point to this image here because Zelia Sanchez was one of Nora's professors. Yes, yes. Um, I feel like uh, in Puerto Rico, there's like, uh, I would say three main artists like Celia Sanchez, Marimater O'Neill, Ivelisse Jimenez, um, that really shaped my work and moved me in the direction that I wanted to go um, as painting, in, in the expanded field, in mm -hmm. conversation like painting and sculpture. Mm -hmm. And I found that uh, connection with these artists and it was, it was in their work, you, you can see. Um, so it was a place to start. Oh, and here as well. So here, oh, um, yes. these are, this bottom painting and the l right one, um, they're mine. But I wanted to also share like two other uh, uh, American artists that really shaped me and influenced me, which was like Eva Hess and Donald Judd. Even though my work is not, it doesn't look minimal, <laughs> and it's actually very the opposite. It's like very baroque and like more about max, maximalist, yeah. maximalist <laughs> instead of a minimalist. But they really helped me to go forward and bring out the painting from the wall and, and, and think of the painting as a sculpture and that have other fields to live in. And so I wanted to share a little bit of that. Yeah. <clears throat> I love this one. Um, just in our discussion earlier, you said that despite all the energy innovation that was happening on the island, there was still lack of opportunity. So you did find yourselves in moving to, what, you, to New York and nor to Chicago. So I want to ask about um, that idea of displacement, of leaving, of this coming and going, and how displacement um, has affected your work um, and your creative practices. The subjects in Nora's paintings have, you know, she, these ones in particular, Nora, maybe you can speak about this one. Uh, you know, these serve as an ode to all the spaces that you have lived in. <clears throat> so when I moved to Chicago, I had two options, I could continue with what I was doing and I knew how to do, and, but I wanted to question myself and like go to the roots of my interest into, in, in space. And one of the things I did, I, I drew a lot of like different mental maps that included my influences, my references, and also I started drawing all the places I live in through my life. <clears throat> and I end up with 20 something um, drawings of floor plans of these places and where I have, so I selected some here. And for me that was like, oh wow, I think this is my interest in space. This was a little bit of like my lack of ownership of always moving, of always being this place through my life as a, as a child. <laughs> and so for me, the way to obtain ownership of a space was through my work, was through my paintings. And, and I started bringing that, uh, those ideas into my work and like figuring out how in the way I work and my interest in material, how I will like make that visually possible and as an object, as a sculpture. So <clears throat> this is like the beginning. And then I started like realizing all the details, the architectural details that I remember of like the tile floor, the ornamentation in the, in the space, outside um, the house, inside the house. And I wanted to make work with that. So I wanted to use tiles, but I didn't want to buy the tiles. I wanted to make them myself because it's part of my process. It's, I mean, um, I felt like this is part of being a, a painter. So I, uh, figured out a way of like how to make tiles using resin and pigment, pouring that material, let it dry, and then cut it into pieces 
where I can cut them as a square, I can cut them organically in any shape, and then I install them as in this one was, it's called my first shower, <coughs> making reference to the first showers I remember in, in the first house I remember I live. Um, it's 18 inches by 18 inches, so it's like very little, it's like kind of like I just fit myself in there. Um, but it's also playing with memory, playing with the scale, um, how I remember now that shower very little and how I thought it was very big. So it's like playing a little bit with it. But everything in that piece um, is made out of paint, even the, dra the drainage is made out of acrylic. So it's like important for me to make every part of it. <clears throat> so that's one, and then this is the other one. This is my graduation piece um, at the Art Institute called Pieces from Home. And for me, that one, it was like a synthesis of different places I put together and collaged them together and made them clash and of different places. I remember I lived different floors and became this sculptural piece, um, including wood floor, which was the new, um, Material I experienced in Chicago, which is like people have like wood floors, which in Puerto Rico everyone mostly will have like tile floor. Um, it makes more sense with the weather. I think here in West Palm Beach, probably many houses has tile floor too. Um, so yeah. I kind of wanted to add and, and maybe question, uh, um, pose you a question because something that I've noticed as a curator with for artists, Puerto Rican artists who go to Chicago is that they're really focused on process and it's they're very like painting <coughs> heavy um, and they're really focused on materials and you know Chicago's a painting city if you might you know when in New yeah. York in the 70s um, people are doing performance and conceptual art there was still like a very strong painting tradition in Chicago <clears throat> so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that education shaped how your work evolved in Chicago yeah. in the sense that perhaps as an artist and, and also as a curator there aren't like such a huge pressure of the market to maybe produce something for to sell, uh -huh. and maybe there's more freedom to experiment with the process and with materials that perhaps is not afforded in another city where the market is a little bit stronger. Can you talk a little bit about how yeah. you think the context of Chicago, the architecture, the process, the painting history shaped some of your work? So specifically, I, <clears throat> I, I was accepted in various uh, schools around the United States. I, I was accepted in Hunter, in San Francisco and also in Chicago. But one of the reasons I, I was like, that I said before, but also was like, I'm like, I'm going to Chicago because I was interested in, in materiality and in, in, in what it means and what it adds to the work and the process of making the work. And I went into the Department of Fiber and Material Studies at the Art Institute, which the conversation around the department, <clears throat> even though you end up making painting, um, it's really about the process and the labor and how do that add into the work. Like in my case, like why not to go to Home Depot and buy the tiles or, you know, the mater material and then install it and make it look like a floor. Why to make it myself? Like what do that add to it and, and how it's, um, for me, it's just become like language, mm -hmm. that a pictorial language that something that I already buy made would not have if I don't make it myself. And, and so these are conversations that are very strong in, in Chicago, I think. I don't know if that answer. Yeah, that makes sense. <coughs> you want to add something already? Well, I kind of want to pivot to, to, from painting to printmaking. Um, since the traditions of printmaking, well, yeah. you know, Puerto Rico has a well-established history of printmaking. Um, and um, you both have ties to printmaking, Carla, through your research, Nora, through your work and your um, uh, f f uh, f frotage. Frotage. Rubbings. Excuse yeah. me. <laughs> the rubbings. Um, frotage <clears throat> is, a, is a technique that, maybe you can tell us what frotage is. It's... 
um, is pictured here. So frottage, uh, which is also called rubbings, it's a technique where you like take a material, paper or fabric, or you put it on top of an uneven um, surface or texture, and then with another, um, uh, with a graphite or a material that you can like rub on on onto it, and then you have you end up with a print of that texture. Um, so it's basically that. Um, I think everyone have done it with a peseta, with a quarter, put a paper, and then with a pencil, get the print of the of the quarter. So it's that's rubbing. <laughs> so um, we decided to include this piece because this piece is right now on view in an exhibition. That it's. Um, if you want to go back a little bit, yeah. Um, that is uh, on view right now at the MCA that Carla has curated in Entre Horizontes. And if you want to talk a little yeah, bit I'll about it. I'll talk that. a little bit about it. So I was really interested in thinking about these several generations of artists that have moved to Chicago to go to the Art Institute, mostly the Art Institute, most of them painters, and what they had in common and make a show around that, but also around all the social justice movements that connect Puerto Rico with Chicago because of that huge diasporic community that is very much active and very activist. Um, so the show really kind of unites the social aspect um, or the social justice aspect that connects the island with Chicago, but also the aesthetic or the artistic. And as part of that, one thing that I had noticed among these artists was that there was a connection between painting and printmaking. And for me, that was really interesting because Puerto Rico has a very strong printmaking tradition that dates from the 1940s, I would say, um, where there were a lot of printmaking workshops uh, connected to the government. And a lot of artists worked for the government as printmakers during the day and then made their own work at night. A lot of them were painters. So they, they included some of those printmaking techniques in their work. And starting with Arnaldo Rocha Ravel, who we spoke about, he went to the Art Institute of Chicago in the mid-1985, in I think, mid-1980s. And um, he developed this technique where he would use models and place them on the floor and put a wet canvas that he already prepared on top and he would make rub um, the paint, like rub the canvas and with the shape of the body underneath. It was very performative. Um, it wasn't representative. It wasn't a representation of a body, but it was more like the trace that the body left upon the canvas. And I thought that was really interesting. And when I was seeing all these other artists, like Angel Otero is another artist that uses printmaking techniques. Nora uses printmaking techniques as well. So I started looking at this thread of several generations of artists that are really thinking uh, about printmaking as a technique as it relates to painting. Um, and a part of that that I wanted to add, because it goes back to what you were saying about displacement, is that for me, something that I thought was really interesting was thinking about printmaking as a technique, as a metaphor that could talk about displacement and identity formation in movement or um, as yeah, as a way of um, thinking about identity formation. So really printmaking, what it is, is you transfer materials from one surface to another, and what gets left behind and what gets added in that process is what happens when it's left in one surface to another. So thinking about displacement in the sense of what happens um, to a body, what happens to someone when they leave their place of origin, they displace, they're displaced, they move to New York or to Chicago, what is left um, behind and what is gained in the process. So thinking about that in terms of identity formation um, for diasporic communities. Yeah. And for me, uh, robbing this technique of, pre of pre-making um, was a way of me, for me to take with me a space to take a fragment of a space, to take and frottage a floor and on paper or fabric and then take it with me and then use it in, 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 in my work. Um, so it was a way to transfer place. Um, and then what has happened in the past, I would say three, four years is that I wanted to not only be 
only attached to a specific place, but also I start creating my own textures of floors or, or shapes and then transfer them into the canvas and manipulate them. Kind of like taking a little bit of ownership of the technique. Um, <coughs> And, and that's what I'm sharing right here, how I create what I call la plancha, which is will be like... Like a master plate. Like a master plate. Mm -hmm. So I created with a cheaper material um, paste. I create in, in a wood uh, panel. I create this shape with all these textures. And then I put it on the floor and then I and I put the fabric on top and then I frottage with the material, which is like, I use like colored pencil sticks and to create that um, print of that texture. And then I stretch that into the canvas and do like a light color. In this case, this blue indigo. Um, and then play with that. Um, in, this, in, in this one, um, so that, I'm playing a little bit with the scale. It's like a, this one is like a more formal artwork, um, which is my interest in minimalism. <laughs> um, so uh, I created a, in the panels that are on the top, the same type of texture in some way in like the negative part of it, but in a different scale that referencing the, the frottage that I, that I made. <clears throat> I think it makes so much sense that uh, you went from the architectural memory, kind of memory drawings to printmaking because it's kind of capturing this fleeting memory, this fleeting um, moment. You know, you're kind of grasping at them however you can. And I, and I didn't include it in this slideshow to not deviate too much, but I have done it to doors to dressers, right, to right. furniture, to other things um, where I take a print and maybe combine it with another part of, of painting that I create to put next to it. Um, and then this one is me trying to play around. So I created like these textures with using paper of other things and then I frottage that, I take that print, I stretch it, and then like paint on top of it. Um, this one kind of rem remember a little bit more of, of a floor plan. This one is more um, organic and trying to break space um, with this lineal um, uh, line that I divide in the painting, which you will see repetitive in different ways through my work. I think there's like two paintings upstairs, including the one down downstairs here, which create that tri triangle. So it's like, um, again, repeating that shape of division of the rectangular. Um, yeah. Here we go. And that There's goes more. with printmaking, like a lot of these artists that are included in the exhibition in the MSA that don't really use brushes, <laughs> you know, they, they use other, right. other tools that, and some of them are related to printmaking. So I think it's really interesting. Right. There's like painters that don't use a brush, they have other techniques. Um, and I think it's really interesting in your work if you could maybe talk a little bit about that process and like mm -hmm. how, how you use certain tools and certain techniques to make this like sculptural texture painting that is made without like traditional painting utensils. Um, well, I, 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 I use uh, very industrial like hardware uh, tools that are made for um, install tiles or create these textures that you have to create with the grout first yeah. and to then install the tile so it can kind of create the better glue, uh, yeah, better texture to, to stick together. Um, so I, I use whatever I need. <laughs> Um, and then I use sometimes brushes that are, are meant for other things that are not for painting. That, that have like different uh, threads.
this one is combining two um, frottage floor that I created in the studio and then I frottage it. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I love those paintings. Yeah. <coughs> I do want to just touch on these yeah, paintings yeah. because I've, these paintings to me are um, so fascinating because they're the most uh, figurative paintings I've ever seen you make. <laughs> um, can, and I learned a bit more about them today. I've, I've actually seen both of them in person. Um, and I remember seeing, this was the first show I ever saw yeah. that, that I came to see you at. Um, and then this one, so that's up right now, I think. Or just yes, close. Yes, it's yeah. up right now, yeah. too. Um, so these two paintings specifically, um, I don't usually make work like reference an event that is happening or like I'm reacting to a to something that is happening in the world or something. But I think this, uh, when I was starting this painting, which is called Somos Mas, um, was the summer of 2019. And it was the biggest, I would say, protest that happened in Puerto Rico, um, wanting the government of Puerto Rico to resign and and leave, leave leadership. Um, and the whole uh, country like really came together to demand this. And for me, this painting um, are these people together marching f to the protest, which is like, the, f the five big um, leaves are like, there's always a front line in a protest, and then the rest is all the people. And uh, that was my way. I couldn't be in Puerto Rico um, in the protest. I was in, in my Greenpoint studio in Brooklyn. So it was like my way of being there, um, supporting the, the protest, was to make this painting called Somos Mas. Somos Mas, was one of the chanting, the strong chanting that happened that was like, somos mas y no tenemos miedo. Like we are more and we are not afraid um, to demand what we wanted. Um, and it, it did happen. <laughs> he had to resign. It was a, a very strong victory um, for the people of Puerto Rico. And this, the one on the right is called the air that we breathe. And that one, I did it on on the pandemic year in 2020, and it in it referenced the protests that happened through United States and also other countries came together with it um, in protest of the death of George Floyd, and that one I feel like it was such a heated and intense. Um, atmosphere that was in the streets and while we all were living, which was the pandemic, um, it was very powerful. And for me, that painting um, portrayed that that summer. It's not moving? Um, there was something just kind of go back to what we were talking about, ma the materiality of the painters who don't use brushes. I mean, I, I almost think that there's this aspect of mimesis that Nora is uh, working through, where she's trying to make, um, you know, cement out of um, paint and tiles out of acrylic. Um, and I, I love that. And I don't, uh, I don't know, I mean, we're just thinking about Thinking about Krauss and the essay that kind of inspires Nora, um, Sculpture in the Expanded Field from 1979, where she is pushing for the idea of, you know, kind of moving into postmodernism of sculpture, leaving the pedestal, and it's now entering into, you know, urban spaces. It's now, it has entered, it's arrived into urban spaces into settings that aren't traditionally known for art viewing. Um, and Nora's sort of always grappling with that in-between space mm -hmm. and of not painting, not sculpture, maybe you could, and material that's not tile but looks like tile. So yeah. you know, maybe, can you talk a little bit more about that interstitial space? Um, 
So I like to mimic things, <laughs> yeah. and and I and I walk around and I see this texture in in a wall and in, in, in the street, and I'm like, how can I make that? How can I bring that into the painting? And for me, that's like like a pictorial language that I want to bring into the work and and take like a fragment. For me, it's like I like to take fragments from ordinary ordinary life, daily life and bring them into the painting and make them into art. Uh, and a prompt to make a, a, a abstraction or a painting. Um, so I just go and research and like look for what type of material will give me that texture. And that's how I start building up uh, a painting. But how do you know when? Like, how do you know? Can you tell us about the decision making? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. I mean, everything started with a drawing, okay, uh, with oh, a sketch. Okay. Um, and I had these images that come to me and, and these compositions that come in my head and I draw them. And then once I have that, I start to figure it out. Okay, how can I, how can I make this? And a lot of... A lot of change happened in the process, mm -hmm. but I do have I do need to have a plan of like what layer will come first, what layer will come okay. after. Um, this painting, the one that the green one that had the leaves kind of like hugging the painting, everything started because I wanted to make a paint. I, I wanted to hug a painting mm -hmm. <laughs> in a way, um, in a way like jewelry. Um, when you're like having a, a ring and you create less a setting for a for a gem, uh, it needs something that holds the the jewelry, the rock, right. Right? right? So I wanted to do that in the painting in some way, and it kind of like became kind of like a hug um, of the painting. Uh, I don't know if you this okay. the, the previous yeah, one. It's like <laughs> if I get it in the right spot, we can go faster. Oh, I want to talk about these totemic works, but maybe we want to see the hug. I mean, it's not that important, but... Um. I love these because this is when, and I really think about yeah. Chicago and as the architecture city, um, mm. because, and you know, and your time in Chicago, your time in New York, how these works are sort of like painting gone vertical. Yeah. Um, You've moved. You've moved up. Yeah, I move up. <laughs> um, I mean, I wanted. I, I. I. The way that I think of how to make a painting is very like creating a collage of different things and put them together. And sometimes is they kind of like stuck together, and it just came very like naturally and organic. Me wanting to stack a lot of paintings together um, and they became this totemic uh, um, uh, sculpt, uh, paintings, sculptural paintings. Um, and that's how I started and I made some drawings. And they look like figures, you know. To me. And they started to look more like figures. Um, Those two. Kind of like people. Um, these are called the guardians, El Sol y la Luna, and for me, um, that was part of a show that I had in, in South Korea uh, called Temples of the Sea. And I was thinking of an island as a temple in the sea. Right. And of course, I'm thinking of Puerto Rico. And these two came, after that came this idea for those um, totems called the guardians, because I thought these are the guardians of the temple. Um, that is some way maybe it's the people of the island is the guardian of the temple. Um, so I'm sorry. I feel like what's happening right now in my work um, is not that I'm leaving behind the idea of displacement, the idea of home. I think is that you change, you grow, your your get interested in all the new things. And for me, I think after the pandemic, the imagination um, came through uh, a lot of drawing that I was making in that time. And I feel like I'm exploring new directions. And in some way, some figure 
figurative elements um, are coming through the work and I am allowing it. I am allowing myself to play and to experiment with composition and like new motifs into the, into the work um, and see where they take me. Um, sometimes in the moment that I'm making, I don't have all the answers, but I have an impulse, a very strong impulse to make something. And I feel like through the process of making them, it just develop and reveal, which is like what happened in this show that is called Clouds in the Expanded Field. I wanted to paint clouds. <laughs> and, and it's something that relates to to the, I think it's, it's at the beginning, but yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, no, don't I'm worry. Sorry about this. I did, I did, I didn't thought I was gonna talk about clubs right now, but um, but I want to talk. Uh, tell yeah. them, tell them about the Instagram that that kind of started oh. our whole. So a little bit, a little this. bit about the pandemic was like, I, I think many people spent time walking around and going to the park, and have a more medi me meditation process. You may spend more time with your partner or alone or and think and my husband and I went a lot to the park and we sit down and look at the sky. And I think there's something about looking at the sky is like kind of like looking for hope <laughs> or to breathe and to have like like a, a I don't know, a like a, huh? a feeling of respite. Yeah. Yeah. Relief from a relief. And John and I, John, my husband, he paints a lot of clouds in his painting, so he's particularly interested in it. And and I felt like, you know what? I think I want to paint clouds. And clouds are part of uh, the tradition of painting landscape. Um, and art can be clouds can be very temperamental. They can set a mood. And anyway, I started and and decided to paint, uh, start painting making some paintings out of clouds and not knowing where it would take me. But now that I think about it, um, I feel like uh, clouds are free, are, are ephemeral. They move through borders. Um, mm -hmm. And f for me, they become like, they have become like a symbol of freedom. Yeah. And And... And that's something that I didn't think of it at the beginning of deciding to start working with that element in the work. It seems like for me like a new direction in your work yeah. and like something that I've noticed through the years is that slowly you've been removing some of the context uh -huh. behind the motifs that you use. For example, the concrete ornamental block was mm -hmm. in some paintings it's very visible and others like you really zoom in on a particular motif like the leaf motif that right. also looks like an eye it can also suggest like a sensual form like yeah. a curve like all these different things mm -hmm. um and that for me is really interesting right because you're still talking about identity mm -hmm. in a way right mm -hmm. but you're removing all these elements from a legible context and making them completely self-referential. Right. Yeah. And with this this new work, the it's so much more organic mm -hmm. and it's so much more free. And I know that that freedom for you is something that you think about a lot in your yeah. work and right. as a as a creative pursuit. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how you're seeing this new direction um, evolving um, in the next yeah. year, for example. Are you seeing like this is like a new avenue that you're exploring, or or how, how are you seeing this evolve? Well, I think um, I think we'll continue evolving, and it's something important to me. Sorry, <laughs> is that I want the work to be open and to have a conversation with anyone, even though they don't know anything about me or my references or where I'm from, of Puerto Rico, or all our history. I still want them to have a conversation with the work. Um, but I think there's some things that have happened lately, um, which is like the making of, of these totemic sculptures, paintings, and now the video, I am feeling that I want to incorporate some, probably maybe in the future performance, and also making these sculptures to be um, maybe out of made, made out of bronze, so they can be outside, mm -hmm. 
um, in the landscape. Um, so all of the, this is going to take time and money, so please buy my work. <laughs> um, so um, so I, can, I can actually do it. And, and the video, I feel like it opened up for me a new way of yeah. occupying space. Yeah. And that's something I want to do. Um, uh, it, might, it might be video on the floor, I don't know. Um, but I think... I think um, all of these things that have happened this year will develop into new into, into new work. The video is here. It's upstairs, and it's time to go. So now the piranda is <laughs> coming. Thank you, Nora. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, everyone.